okay. of a, a documentary. Okay. You want me to use this? Yeah. Um, I'm... It is Hello? Good? Yes. Yeah. Okay. You can hear us. Okay. Well, thank you, first of all, for coming today. And um, so the story behind the making of the documentary is twofold. The, the first is, how many of you use YouTube? <laughs> um, and how many of you think that the information that you're getting on YouTube is, is accurate? Um, how many of you use it primarily for entertainment to watch? Okay. And um, how many of you post things to YouTube? Anybody? Okay. Um, so in looking at the social media space, um, I realized that there was a great deal of coverage of Twitter, of Facebook, uh, TikTok, but no one had really looked at the content that was available on, on YouTube. Now, the interesting thing about YouTube is that it's owned by Google, the two most visited websites in the world by far are Google's number one and YouTube is number two. So it is the most influential, by far, owned by the same company. And in thinking about, OK, the great thing about it, of course, is that it's free. Um, and how does it maintain it's free access. Well, that's because you are being monetized. Um, you as an audience, you as a viewer, um, are being um, your, what, what, the time that you spend on YouTube is how they monetize the platform. So they realize that what keeps people Primarily, that's not necessarily each one of you, but the average person on YouTube is watching content that gets an emotional response. The emotional response that keeps people clicking on the next video tends to be something that makes you angry, something that, that enrages you. And that led, for many years, um, to growing division among people, uh, propaganda, and uh, radicalization, as, as you saw in the, in the documentary. And I felt that it was time to look at the platform of YouTube and not just let them get a pass uh, as something that, um, that is something other than a social media platform, because it truly is a social media platform. Um, and, um, and it turned out that when I approached Alex Winter, who directed it, uh, he felt the exact same way. And he had even deeper knowledge, having directed documentaries about the internet and he knew many of the YouTube influencers and stars quite well. And it was very important to us to be able to feature people who have been very successful on the platform and also people like Caleb Cain, who were radicalized and essentially you know, became neo-Nazis and have come out the other side. Uh, and we also wanted to talk about how marginalized peoples um, like LGBTQ+, like Natalie Wynn and Contrapoint, um, were able to find uh, a community and reach a wider audience than they ever would have on any other platform. And I, I think the important thing to realize is that I'm a filmmaker. Uh, I've had very successful films in the course of my career. I've made The Walking Dead. But 
YouTube, people on YouTube who are influencers make more money than the biggest acting stars in the world. That's how big and important that platform is and very rarely gets that kind of scrutiny. Uh, you, in the movie, the movie follows the history of uh, YouTube. Uh, as you mentioned yesterday, uh, some of the founders of the YouTube are your closest friends. How they react when you uh, tell them that you are uh, interested in make, making a story about uh, YouTube? Uh, do they have that uh, enthusiasm? Uh, do, does they, do, do they be, uh, does they be, uh, I think they were aware that, uh, where that this movie can uh, go during the process of filming? Well, when I approached Steve Chen, who's the first person interviewed in the documentary, who is the chief technology officer and co-founder of YouTube, um, I, I said, this is not going to be pro-YouTube propaganda. This is going to look at it as objectively as possible, which is, it does a great deal of good but it also has radicalized people who've then gone on to commit mass murders, uh, like in Christchurch, New Zealand. And, um, you know, and he said, I understand. He said, the, you know, when, when he and his partners created YouTube, as you saw, it was really, essentially, they wanted to post videos and they were thinking they would be a competitor to hot or not. You know, um, their ambitions were, were not, were never as large as YouTube has since become. And, uh, and, I, and I think that I can't speak for him. Luckily, we were able to have him speak for himself in the documentary. Um, and we had a screening that he attended because he lives in Taipei in Taiwan. Um, and audience members were able to ask him questions. And he was asked, why did you participate in this? And he said, because I think it's important that the story get out. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're delighted that he feels that way because there's no way that you can say, oh, this is a, a pro YouTube puff piece that is propaganda. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, guys, how do you like the movie? Uh, what was the thing that inspires you the most? By me, I like the movie pretty much because it uh, shows the world how it works and how we can find information. But at the same time, to show how it has a power over us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that's that's what we intended. So we feel as filmmakers that we succeed when an audience member says, "Okay, this is what I, I learned from it," which is um, which is not necessarily to, to fear the platform, but to be a more informed viewer. And yeah. At the same time, we can see how uh, people use the platform uh, just for fun. And we can see the people that actually try to find things that can develop their mind. And by that, we see the difference where the same application has bad benefits and the good the yes. But maybe a crucial thing is the power of algorithm. Those content creators can exist without that power of the algorithm and monetization that goes right. uh, behind. The, the important thing to, to think about this, though, is that algorithms are designed by people with a particular goal. So it's not like the algorithm is doing this on its own. It's been programmed to achieve particular results. And in this case, um, it's been, it, it, it was much worse in the past. And in the past, there was an algorithm that very quickly, even if you weren't looking to be radicalized, even if you weren't clicking on a particular channel that was radical, um, you very quickly ended up um, viewing radicalized content. 
that has that has changed. Um, but it, it once again is because that's how your time spent on the platform is what is making it so successful. It is it is the um, it is essentially the the global town hall. It is where people, regardless of how niche, how how um, uh, diverse their interests are, can find someone who's got a channel that addresses that particular interest. Um, so that's that's the good thing. The, the the bad thing is that the people who are often making the most money um, are the people who are spreading propaganda uh, and and creating fear. And fear is what drives us apart and creates division and and leads to and and, and leads to to violence. Um, but then you know you have Ryan Kanji, the young boy, uh, who's literally you know he's making over twenty million dollars a year. He and his family from essentially unboxing toys, so he is financed by toy companies as well as through his YouTube channel. Um, and you know when when Alex interviewed him, I, I asked you know does he seem to actually be like a normal, well-rounded kid. Um, Alex was a the director was a child actor, and he actually made a documentary about the dangers of being a child actor. So more than anybody else, um, Alex is aware of what it's like to be exploited as a child, and he felt that that Ryan's family is doing their best not to overexploit him. At the same time, when you are essentially a young child who is financing your family um, by having a YouTube channel where you're being um, where you you're being broadcast many many hours a day, that's also not a normal childhood. Uh, in the previous uh, conversation, uh, someone mentioned that sometimes they feel insecure or scary by using uh, some of the platforms or some of those platforms. Uh, can we talk about the feelings that you have during uh, watching some of the videos that uh, on YouTube or on other uh, uh, networks? Are, are those videos that you're seeing uh, because you clicked on it or because it was recommended to you and it just started playing? Um, you know, so 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 that's the thing is that the the recommender algorithm is trying to find the content that will keep you online. So it's you know, so it's it's a two way street, which is in part what you choose and watch and don't turn off and move on to something else is training the algorithm to give you more content. And let's say you're you're watching something simply because you're you're like I can't believe I'm seeing this. It thinks that you like it. Sometimes I mean like if it's something that consumes you then I just can't get out of it. Or it can also happen that uh, for example some of my friends are watching something and it's like okay I want to see it and I don't want to like just watch it. And anyway, so that helps train the algorithm not to give you more content that you're not going to like. Um, like also, meaning that like um, sometimes we see that with my friends. For example, we talk about something, uh, 
but if you always uh, see that like a way you have a part on and so you need a part on and you're just like wondering how it's possible like every like three hours yes it does how or how is that possible um well there are things that are actually against the law in different countries um I mean, I've certainly experienced talking with someone over my cell phone about something, and the next thing I know, if I'm on Facebook or if I'm uh, even doing a search on Google um, or on YouTube, an ad will come up for the very thing that I was talking with someone about that I didn't even search for, which I have to say is very unnerving to think that there, there's no place that you're safe. What else is it listening to? It's why I don't use Siri. I've deactivated Siri because Siri's listening. I do not, you know, a lot of my friends have smart, like an Alexa or a, um, or a Sonos speaker that uses Alexa. Well, they're listening all the time. It's, it's, you know, that's how you can say, that's how when you say, hey, Siri, or something, uh, it's listening even when you're not saying, hey, Siri. And that was really unnerving to me. Um, and when I deactivated all of those, it helped not have those, um, those ads pop up as much. Um, but it's not, it is, it is illegal, especially for, for kids. I don't know what age you are, but this is all illegal. Because it's, it is listening all the time. Yeah. <laughs> That's the, you know, even if you haven't quote unquote activated it, um, sort of, um, it, it is still listening in the background. Um, you know, that is, I'm not an expert on this, um, but, uh, but I know there is a lot of research going on in this that is saying that the, various companies, whether it's Apple or Google, um, Facebook, are violating the, the rules governing what they can um, what, what they can listen to and how long they can keep it. Um, and that's why, especially in the EU, and the UK and the US are, are further behind in this. They're, they're trying to come up with rules that protect content, um, users of, of any kind of content and any kind of, of web search or social media platform from, from being, from essentially being used to monetize their search engine to, you know, there, there, there have been a, a number of studies that have shown that um, a lot of these companies do not seem to be following the, the rules protecting viewers and um, users of, of technology. Uh, that was my uh, next question. Uh, how to be safe on the internet? How we can uh, uh, develop our skills to recognize what is disinformation, what, what is malinformation, misinformation, or fake news in general? You know, I wish I, wish I had the answer to that. Um, but one of the things that I do is um, I support an organization called the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, mm -hmm. ICIJ. They are the ones that broke the story about the, the Panama Papers and the corrupt politicians, et cetera, who have offshore bank accounts that are essentially plundering countries um, treasuries for their own gain. Um, and I follow those journalists um, because I 
can, I generally, not always, I mean, everyone makes a mistake, um, but I, I think they're more trustworthy. Um, but it's, it's very, very difficult because, you know, um, I have found that I have retweeted propaganda. Mm -hmm. Luckily, my followers are often people who have expertise in different fields, and they'll say, do you know that you just tweeted or retweeted propaganda? Um, so at least I'm informed. And then I can say, that was incorrect. Um, and I'm guilty of, of, uh, of tweeting propaganda. Are you checking what you're reading, what you're watching? Um, are you checking the source of the information that you're watch? Hmm? That you're share? You know, the, with Google, once again, Google owns YouTube, um, people pay to be higher up in the search results. And as a result of that, um, you know, you are not necessarily getting the best result. You're getting the result that the person or the company has paid to be the, the top result. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example of how I learned about piracy uh, on the internet, which I'm a big fan of a soccer, t a football team in the UK called Arsenal. Yay, Arsenal, we finally beat Man City. Um, and, um, and for a very long time, the matches were not broadcast in the United States, except on certain channels that if you were staying in a hotel, you didn't get. So there was a very important match a number of years ago. So I went online to see if I could watch it. Um, and the top search result said, you know, live stream Arsenal versus Tottenham Hotspur, which is it's called the North London Derby. So I click. It has visa information. So you can, so you can put in your credit card number. It looked totally legitimate. And then I thought, wait a minute. At that time, Fox Soccer Channel had the rights. I'm in the United States. This is not a Fox Soccer Channel website. So I got in touch with a friend of mine who worked for Fox Soccer. And I said, I'm about to put my credit card information in this website. Is, is this some sort of Fox Soccer website? And they said, no, it's a pirate site. And if you put your credit card information in there, they will have it and they, you may get, you know, they, they will possibly uh, fraudulently, um, um, you know, charge to your credit card. But for a very long time, the credit card companies in the United States were allowing their cards to be used by pirate sites. Legislation changed that. But if I hadn't been able to get in touch with a friend who worked at Fox Hacker, I would have been I would have been supporting a pirated website, um, and uh, so that that's how prevalent it is. And that once again, so there are two things. One is it was the top search result on Google was a pirate site, and secondly, the credit card companies were in cahoots with them, allowing their credit cards to be used on pirate sites. We have to be aware about yes. a lot of, yeah. 
trust that we have. Uh, yes, and it's it's, it's very around. difficult. How do you know? Yeah. I mean, you'd be unlikely to know that it that the rights should have been Fox Soccer. So. It is an era of information, era uh, where we can we have to look around everything just to protect ourselves and at the same time to be uh, absorb to absorb proper information to have clear mind what the things yes. are, how and, the things and, are uh, and I, I do think that hopefully the EU will will design what you know are called guardrails to protect viewers um, and to protect truth as opposed to spreading propaganda um, and it's it's very difficult because you know people say well everyone should be able to say what they want okay but if you're spreading lies if you are um you know you saw in the documentary the the women who were subject to gamergate their lives were ruined because people went after them um you know it's called doxing i was doxed once uh believe me it, it it's no fun i mean you know, people put posted where I lived, and I started getting death threats um, for something in which I was telling the truth, but I had angered someone who was spreading propaganda. And they activated not only trolls, but real legitimate people to come after me and try to shut me up, which is incredibly frightening. Guys, if you have a question for Gail, we have 10, 15 minutes more. Mm -hmm. Please. And, and you, can, you can ask about anything I've done. You don't have to ask about YouTube. If you want to talk about any of the films or TV series I've done, please feel free to ask about those. Yeah, so I want to ask two questions about uh, the film that you documented that you just watched. Uh, the first one is, uh, are there any follow-up projects or topics related to the documentary? Uh, um, well, right now, um, Alex and I have talked about future projects. Um, it really is going to depend on where we can get financing, um, because right now, financing is much harder than when we initially made this film, which we started three years ago. Um, and we made it entirely during all of the restrictions and lockdowns of the pandemic, uh, which was very challenging. Um, and the second thing that we're doing is we are, um, the reason I'm here in North Macedonia is because we want to be accessible uh, and to talk about this and to make sure as many people as possible see this film and start thinking about their own use of social media. Uh, we also um, have been invited to a number of different conferences. We were, uh, we were at the Cambridge University in the UK Disinformation Summit, where we met the top researchers on this. Uh, you can imagine, it's sort of like going to uh, have an exam and you're not really sure that you understand the subject you think you do, but it's terrifying because we are not experts in disinformation. We made a documentary. We showed it to them, and they loved it. And they loved it because they felt it was more accessible than their, than their research, which you kind of need a degree in disinformation to be able to understand a lot of their research. They felt that, that this was very successful. And now we are also going to be meeting with policymakers in the EU, the UK, and the United States, talking, bringing together people who have excellent ideas, um, not to quote unquote break the internet, but to make it, it safer and, um, and to be able to um, rely more on, on truth. Just to give you an idea, um, one of the, one of the, the big things um, of misinformation uh, on YouTube was, what led to the January 6th violence at the US Capitol, which was an attempted coup. 
um, was the whole idea that Trump had not lost the election in 2020. That that um, so it's called the you know the great lie, right? Well, up until a few months ago, all of the postings on YouTube and other social media would say this is not correct. Trump legitimately lost the election. Biden won. That has been removed. Now, if you go onto most social media and if you go onto YouTube, people are able to say again the great lie that, and say Trump won the election and that it was a fraud. That to me is incredibly dangerous because it's clear there were numerous court cases. You know, the people who stormed the Capitol are being, you know, being sent to jail. But that propaganda is back. So, so clearly, I, I think that there needs to be much more done. And the only way we can do that is through policy. Uh, so my second question is, how did you decide which content creator and experts to feature in the documentary? Um, well, uh, when, when I approached Alex Winter, the director, uh, we, I said, look, I am good friends with Steve Chen. Uh, the co-founder, and I believe it's important to listen to him. I think it's very important to talk to Susan Wojcicki, who at the time was the, the CEO, um, and she's the one who talked Google into buying YouTube. Um, but he is the one who had the relationships with the Smosh Brothers. He had the relationship with, with Ryan's family, um, and he really made all of those choices we in consultation with me um, because he didn't want we've been criticized for not having too many people I mean we, we are not having enough people that we should have talked with a lot more but we felt it was better to have fewer people and be able to understand their perspective as opposed to just a number of different people saying essentially very much the same thing but so it was Alex Okay, and the third point is, uh, how has the documentary received uh, audiences, and have there been any noteworthy reactions or discussions as a result? That's a great question. Um, the we felt that the the hardest audience was the one at the Cambridge Disinformation Summit because those are the experts. So we were very happy to find out that they they found the documentary worthwhile. And since then, we have screened it at a number of universities. Um, Alex participated in the panel at um, UC Berkeley, also known as Cal. And the dean of the law school there is one of the world's leading, well, one of the United States' leading experts on the First Amendment and the Constitution. And the First Amendment is the one that covers free speech. And so there was, and, and also the head of the computer science department and the AI aspect, um, Hani Farid, was part of that was part of that panel, and they both felt that it was it was important because it got people talking about the issue. And the the important thing is for people to to think, to question, to wonder, um, and um, audiences for the most part. Um, have enjoyed it. Um, some people feel it is too pro YouTube and that we should have essentially gone in and just, you know, done a, a documentary that is, these are all the terrible things about YouTube and really not feature any positive aspects. Um, and there are other people um, who felt that it was too negative. So, we tried, it, we were happy that some people think it's too pro and some people think it's too negative because we really wanted to, to try to, to show both sides. Thank you. We have another question. Uh, was there any reaction or statement to this? Well, the good news is. Um, as you, you may or may not know, um, Google spends more money lobbying 
lawmakers and politicians in the United States than any other company. And they could, because of their search engine, they could have buried the search results if you, if you really, they could have, um, if you, you know, type in stream the YouTube effect, it, there could have been no results. But so, um, so they, I have to commend them because that's not what happened. Um, there has been really no negative press from them. Uh, in fact, a lot of our screenings, um, people who work at YouTube or used to work at YouTube have basically, you know, come, they generally don't use their names, but they say, we, we think that it, it's incredibly fair. And, um, and Steve Chen, the fact that Steve Chen is happy is the most important thing in that, uh, because one, you don't want to piss off your friends. And, and secondly, um, it wasn't just all positive. Um, you know, I don't think he's going to come out and say, I think everything in it is, is great. Um, but, uh, but the, the fact that he has promoted it himself, um, on social media and attended the screening in Taiwan, um, you know, really means a lot. Um, and interestingly, um, the film is available for pay-per-view on YouTube. So tell me that isn't ironic. Um, so they agreed to, to host it on their platform. So, um, so that to me, you know, tells you, tells me that, uh, that they're okay with it. Um, right now, if, if you want to watch the, the video anywhere in the world, we have our own Vimeo site, and I'm sorry it's not available in Macedonian, but it's available in 13 different languages, uh, subtitled, uh, on uh, our website, which is www.yteffect.com. And um, so anyone anywhere in the world can watch it from that website. We have one more question, yeah. I would like to ask you is uh, what type of advice would you give for aspiring uh, documentary filmmakers based on your activity with uh, the I, having done big films, you know, Terminator, Aliens, Armageddon, yeah. uh, The Walking Dead, and this is my fourth documentary. I think documentaries are the most important. I really do, and I've done them all, because they, um, you know, they they can expose things that people aren't aware of, and um, and some of my my favorite foreign language films um, have been documentaries. Uh, there was the fascinating documentary from Romania about the scam in the the um, healthcare uh, and the hospitals there. Uh, was fascinating. Um, so, you know, and, and Alex, who directed this, also directed the, a documentary on the Panama Papers. So, so to me, a lot of people are uninterested in reading anymore. So, you know, a lot of investigative journalism, I read it, I love reading, but the impact of seeing something on screen, uh, whether it's on your phone or you know in a theater like this, I think has a, has an even greater impact, uh, especially because you share it in, as an audience. You're watching it collectively together. So my advice is, um, you don't need a lot of money. You you can you can make a film with your phone, um, and you know start with start with small films. You know, start with something that you're passionate about. Uh, a friend of mine right now is doing a documentary about his 100-year-old grandmother and what the world was like when she was growing up, comparing it to what it's like now. And she has some fascinating stories. And I never would have thought that that would be interesting, but it, it turns out that he's now got financing for it because her story is so interesting. So find something that you're passionate about and just start interviewing people. Uh, one more question. 
Okay, we have two more questions. Sure, please. that's fine. That's fine. We can do three. <laughs> okay. Uh, the gentleman over here, blue. yeah, gentleman with the blue shirt. So, Ms. Neil, back in 2007 or 2008, we had further the inverted talk. Uh, that was, I think, the second installment in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, and now we have like more than, uh, than uh, 40 years in series. And how was it like then 15 years ago and right now? What do you think about the Marvel, Cin the Marvel Cinematic Universe right now and their future uh, upcoming projects? Well, I, I made two Hulk movies. Uh, neither of them were that successful. Um, and I made a Punisher movie too. So I've, I've actually made three Marvel Universe um, uh, stories. Uh, and back then, people thought we were crazy. People thought that, you know, no one would be interested in, in comic book characters. I mean, it's, it's so hilarious. Um, that all of the all of the the big shots, the the people uh, in charge of studios, were wrong. Um, but you know, I I, I persevered, and um, the the other interesting story is, uh, um, so we made the Ang Lee, the Ang Lee Hulk, with Eric Bana, and then when we made the Louis Leterrier Incredible Hulk. The person we actually wanted to cast as the Hulk was Mark Ruffalo. And the head of Marvel at the time said, absolutely not. He's not a big star. And by the way, I, I think that Edward Norton did a great job. But it is hilarious now that the person who's most identified with the Hulk was our first choice, Mark Ruffalo. Um, you know, back then, uh, we didn't have the same enormous budgets. Um, but I, I have to say, right now I think, and it's odd coming from me, a big comic book fan, that there are just too many of them. I mean, I, I, I think there's, there are just too many superhero movies. Um, but, um, you know, the audience gets to decide. The audience votes by buying tickets and attending, attending the cinema. So what is it you think? I personally think. Uh, I agree with most people, like, I don't kind of like uh, where Marvel is going right now with their future projects. Um, I think that the good era of Marvel ended like with Infinity War or and or Endgame, some of the other. So, um, anyway, once again, the, the audience decides. Yeah. Um, not, you know, and, and, and that's what speaks to the, the people who green light movies is, you know, you have some failures, and then they cut back. Um, so make sure that the films that you like, hopefully, uh, are the you know hopefully they'll be the successful ones, and they'll be they'll be more in those traditions. What's the next question? Up, the guy with the blue sh uh, uh, with the black shirt. Okay. Yeah, but okay. we can. This is easy. Okay. This okay. Is, okay. Let's it's just easy. let's stick with Let's stick with Yeah. yeah. Let's stick with the girl. And, and then, and then, and then his will be the last. Uh, I have a question for you from what you said earlier um, about like everything from your t-shirt Sure. So. I'm lucky. Um, a lot of times I am on location on a project, so I'm not always home. The people that I worry about are the people who are victims of Gamergate. Uh, right now, Natalie Wynn, because there's so much transgender hate in America and around the world, um, she, she can't come out. And uh, we, we wanted her to be on panels. It's unsafe for her to be on panels. She can't go out in public. I mean, imagine how much your life changes um, because of, you know, because of hatred, because of division. That's why I, I do worry about channels on YouTube that are, that are spewing hate against a particular, a particular religion, a particular, you know, sexual preference, you know, banning books. 
I mean, the fact that we're back in America and there are school districts that are that are banning books um, is is just frightening. And they're not books that are publishing lies. They're they're books that that are that are you know um, novels or they're the truth about about something that certain political politicized people don't want told. And authors of books are now being are being targeted. Um, so I, I really worry about the people who can't afford to move, who can't afford security. Um, I'm lucky, I can move, I can afford security if I need it, but most people can't. And I, and I think that's, that's the danger. And, and if you live in certain communities, the police won't help you because the police essentially feel, well, if you want to be transgender, you know, uh, that's a choice. Or if you want to be, or if you're gay, or, you know, that it's a choice and that you can choose to be something else. So there's very little protection for people, you know, not just in America, but in many places throughout the world. Three questions. The first question is, what is the experience of being a famous Hollywood producer? And what are the pros and cons of that? Well, um, the pros are it's uh, a lot easier than when I was struggling and, um, you know, a bunch of us were sleeping on each other's floors, depending on who had money at the time to be able to pay the rent. Uh, so it's a lot nicer <laughs> when you get paid um, to be doing something that you love. Um, I, the good news also is, other than those rare times when, uh, when I piss off someone on social media, uh, no one recognizes me. I can go anywhere. I, it, it's not like people are running after me for you know my autograph. Um, but I can get my phone calls returned. You know, so if, if I want to reach someone, um, even if they don't know my name, I can say, I produced The Terminator, I produced Aliens, I produced The Walking Dead, and generally someone will call me back. So access is better. The, the problem is that you're always asked, okay, well, what are you doing next? Um, and there are times when you just want to say, well, right now, I just want to enjoy what I've already done and not think about it for a while because there's enormous pressure to try to continue to have success after success after success. And that's tremendous pressure. I mean, it's, it's, I feel it's kind of like being an athlete. Um, you know, an always athlete, shape. <laughs> always, always having, you know, your, your last game. Okay. Well, you were okay. But then everyone hates you if you're not, you know, if you don't win, the race, or if your team doesn't win, or you missed a, you missed a, a penalty, um, that's kind of what, what I feel like. But it's nothing like the scrutiny that, that they have. Um, and, um, you know, and, and in Hollywood, if you've had a failure, people don't like, they, they feel it's contagious. So, you know, so if you're successful, everyone wants to be your friend. Everyone wants to take a meeting with you. If you've just had a failure, no one does. And what's your third question? And the third question is, do you have any advice for the people that want to continue in their future and become successful? And I'm sure I speak for many people here, and we all look up to you. Thank you. Um, what I learned is that there are no shortcuts. Um, people think that, so I, I was lucky. I was very good academically. I went to one of the top universities in the world. Um, and I knew nothing. I, I graduated and thought that I knew a lot. I knew nothing. Um, because learning about something versus doing something are two different things. But I was always humble. 
And I accepted once I realized it that I really didn't know anything and that I had to learn from the bottom up. I never felt that anything was beneath me. So I graduated at the top of my class from Stanford University. One of my first jobs was emptying toilets in motorhomes. Okay, so essentially <clears throat> that is, you know, and, and, and if there were people I remember who said they wouldn't do it. They're not in the industry anymore. I said I would do it, I did it well. I did it well so that I got more responsibility the next time. I didn't have to, I was, a lot of people were afraid, okay, well that's all I'll do the rest of my life. But I was like, you know what? I will volunteer to do whatever needs to be done. I want to be the person that people trust, will do it right and not complain. And consequently, I moved up very, very quickly. Um, and to this day, when I'm on set, if there is a piece of litter, a piece of trash on the ground, I'll go pick it up. I don't expect the person whose job it is to have to do that. Um, so stay humble, work incredibly hard, and when you get an opportunity, make sure you're prepared for it. Um, and, um, and the other thing I learned is don't lie. <laughs> um, best to say, I don't know, but I'll find out. Um, so no one knows everything. And many times I've been put in a situation where someone has said, well, of course you know the answer to this. And it's very difficult to say, well, actually, no, I don't. But if you admit it, you will, and then say, but I'll find out, people will trust you. Because in, in this business, lies catch up with you very, very quickly. And, um, and it is a business, like most businesses, that is based in trust. Is that helpful? Yes, that's, a, that's all. Thank okay, you thank you. Answers, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Gill, for being with us. Thank you. It was, it was a great pleasure, a unique opportunity. One more round of applause for thank this you. opportunity that we have. And have I signed this one? No. I would love to, Please, to sign yeah. it. Let's. So besides the point, I want to ask you, how do we get funding for this? It's, it's so hard. Oh, my goodness. So because there's no U.S. funding, government funding for the arts at all, there's yeah. none. Uh, the many, there's none. Okay. It is okay. because so it's, it's political. Donors, so it's because it's political. Oh, yeah. And um, so it's very, very hard. And, you know, now that the writer's strike has been resolved, okay, hopefully right. it will get a little better. But um, we, we haven't either. been able to work since May. And and the and the actor strike still isn't over. Isn't over. No. Over a year. Well, no, they they. I mean, because of the writers going out, a, a lot of things stopped. Not in May. And so the writers, everyone in the business, has not been able to work. It's a very да, это Да. 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 Слово. They're coming. <laughs>